Coming up, remembering 9-11. We'll hear from Osage and Cherokee people who were living in New York when the terrorist attack took place. Plus, the journalists who covered the story. We'll hear from Charlie LaDuff, who reported from Ground Zero for a year after the attacks. I'm Patty Thalahunga. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Major news from Washington, D.C. as Brian Newland is ceremoniously sworn in as the new Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. Newland is now the lead federal official at the helm of the Interior Department's Indian Affairs Office. This major role oversees the federal government's trust responsibility to tribal nations. He is a citizen of the Bay Mills Indian community in Michigan, and he was the president and resigned to take the position at Interior. Secretary Deb Holland gave the oath of office and praised Newland's track record in a statement saying, Brian has worked on behalf of indigenous peoples and Indian country for decades. His wealth of experience will advance the department's commitment to ensuring tribes have a seat at the table for every decision that impacts them and their communities. Newland was nominated to the position in April. He had strong support from tribal and congressional leaders, and he was confirmed by the U.S. Senate last month. Well, tribes are filing a petition to defend the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act in a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. Brackeen v. Holland alleges ICWA is unconstitutional, saying it discriminates against non-Native homes when placing Native children. Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978 because Native children were being taken from their families and placed in non-Native homes. Research by the National Indian Child Welfare Association shows that 25 to 35 percent of all Native children are being forcibly removed by state child welfare and private adoption agencies. Of those children, 85 percent are placed in non-Native homes, even when fit and willing relatives are available. NICWA has been around for more than 30 years. Among many other services, it was created to protect Native children, offer safe and culturally strong environments for Native children, and provide education and leadership opportunities for tribes and urban Indian child welfare workers. In the next 30 days, additional briefings will be held, heard, and then the High Court will decide if it will hear the case. The state of the Cherokee Nation remains strong. That's the message Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. delivered to citizens on Saturday. His 13-minute speech outlined the tribe's recent accomplishments that included being able to pay every tribal employee throughout the pandemic despite shutdowns. He praised the resiliency of his people and urged them to, to continue that spirit in the future and to keep their language strong. In these challenging times, let us build our nation up. Let us lift each other up. Let us strengthen our sovereignty. Let us use our sovereignty in a way that inspires hope and creates opportunities for all Cherokees today and for generations to come. Saving the Cherokee language is quite simply a mission on which we cannot fail. We must not fail and we will not fail. This was the second year in a row the address was given online due to the coronavirus pandemic. The search is narrowing in a Tulsa, Oklahoma school district for a new mascot. There are two options now for students and parents in the Union Public Schools system to select a new mascot. The school's old mascot used the racist R word, and now the choice is between the Red Hawks or the Bison. The district launched its public search in late June, asking students, parents, teachers, alumni, and the public to contribute ideas to the name change. More than 320 ideas were submitted during the month-long process. 
Now the school is seeking final public input and could make a decision before the end of the year. In Brazil, tribes are taking matters into their own hands to defend their territory against exploitation. Indigenous people are taking part in daily patrols to stop illegal activities on their lands. Loggers, miners and ranchers continue to encroach onto their vast reserve. Nearly 10,000 tribal people live in the reserve and along several rivers that are tributaries to the Amazon River. The patrols include five tribal people who fan out along the edges of the reserve, searching for signs of illegal logging, mining and ranching. We are here to protect the forest, not letting invaders in, loggers and gold miners. We are here to preserve the forest. A case currently before Brazil's Supreme Court could spark a land grab by outside commercial interests eager to exploit the rainforest. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tawahungva. This weekend marks the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Twin Towers in New York City. We'll hear from a native couple who were there. And we hear from a native journalist who covered the tragic events of 9-11 for the New York Times. We'll be right back. Charlie LaDuff was a reporter at the New York Times in the spring of 2001. He had just won his first Pulitzer Prize. He was part of a team that produced a series the Times ran called How Race is Lived in America. Charlie was covering union and labor groups in the fall of 2001 when the terrorist attack shocked the world and the country. For the next year, he reported from ground zero. He would go on to win his second Pulitzer Prize as part of the Times coverage. Charlie LaDuff joins us today. Welcome, Charlie. Hey, Mark, good to see you, brother. As a journalist, it's a once-in-a-lifetime story. Maybe uh, start by uh, reminding us what all happened as you were reporting that story. Uh, let's see if I can. It's, it's kind of a difficult time, you know, but let's see. Do you remember in 2001, the Supreme Court handed the election to George Bush the disputed dangling chads? Remember that? Al Gore steps right. aside. They wrote everything about dangling chads except the working man who was the mechanic for those phone booths or those voting booths. The reason I say that is New York in 2001 had this matching program for anybody that wanted to run for citywide office, $4 for every dollar you raised. So as you might imagine, there was like 500 people on the local ballot. So I set it up to go out with a voting booth mechanic. I meet him in Brooklyn. He's drunk as a skunk. It was funny. We're in a parking lot. And he says, hey, look, you could see the Twin Towers from, you know, Brooklyn, lower Brooklyn. He goes, something hit that. And we were looking at it. We thought it was a small Cessna. And we watched, we watched about 15 minutes later, a second explosion. And you knew it wasn't. So quickly make my way, finally get over to Manhattan with the United States Army on a, on a bus. And um, it was surreal, man. It was like, like the small streets, the colonial streets in, in lower Manhattan were covered in this tan dust. They were empty, it was quiet, and there were 10,000 shoes, 10,000 shoes all pointing north. People ran literally out of their shoes and um, at that point, it wasn't really a reporter because the cell phones had gone dead and everything. And it was just all hands on deck. Can you find somebody alive in this molten, smoking, dusty graveyard? And uh, the one vision I have is, is that pile of steel was about four stories high. And the iron workers were down there with their own kits, their own tools, their own torches. And they had gone into Brooks Brothers and got themselves cashmere coats and fedoras and they're wearing these with their goggles and the, and the sparks are flying. And it, it was perhaps the most exhilarating and saddest night I've ever spent on earth. And that's such a, um, 
trait for journalism that you, it's hard to explain to people outside of the craft because that combination of terror and exhilaration happens on stories, it's certainly nothing this big, but in fact, as everybody's running away from Manhattan, journalists are running toward Manhattan. Some of them, and right. some of them not. I mean, I know a lot of them. You know, some of them got off the subway and went, oh no, and headed, headed north. Uh, a, we, we take out the, the reporters for a minute. We just talk about humanity. The thousands of people, substantial, ordinary people who answered that bell. You didn't know if uh, something else was coming. And they just came. And by morning, um, th there were no authorities. The authority, for, for, forget the head boss, man, because when it really hits, they're, they're nothing. Natural leads evolve. And it, it started to thin out. It was a crime scene. It was a recovery scene. And so everybody that had a badge was starting to take control. Police, fire, paramedics, you name it. And I came out of the hole to go north to Times Square where the New York Times, which New York Times Square is named after the New York Times. And I had to give them my notes, had to give them my notes. And I turned in my notes and I'm coming back down. I'll never forget him, head of security for the New York Times, Danny. I said, Danny, I think I'm gonna need a badge to get back in. And I don't know what to do. And I don't want to lie because you don't want to lie as a reporter. And uh, yeah, Danny gave me his badge. He said, New York Times, see it? Yeah. And after a couple of months, um, I wanted to give it back to Danny because the working people had given me a construction badge. And Danny said, keep that. And I'll never forget Danny. So. Yes, secretaries, nurses, reporters, paramedics. If you, I'm sorry, Mark, I hadn't prepared, but it's all flooding back. I remember, I remember that second day and all the volunteers, people wanted to help, people could still be alive. They only found 12 people, but we, we all wanted to help. So they were putting people in groups and sort of staging areas to the side, getting you a pair of gloves and buckets. And I remember the Sharpie going around and everybody was writing their phone number and their blood type on their arm in case they fell through this molten crag and crevices. And I remember, that's my reporter eye. I remember the area codes, 718. That's Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn. I remember 516, that's Nassau County. I don't remember a 212, not one. They could have been there, I didn't see them. They weren't prevalent. 212 is Manhattan. It's where the swells live. So when you look at who does what in this country, it's the ordinary, everyday, working people who love their kids and they love their fellow man when it when it really when it really matters and, and that's what I'm gonna I'm gonna disappear this weekend I don't want to see any pictures I don't want to go like to the high school reunion I I'm just gonna go hide in my cabin and think think the good thoughts of the good people you know walking around Manhattan and it was there uh, a couple of weeks after the image that's seared into me is the ordinary people at fire stations and all of the um, photographs and memorabilia and just reaching out to the country through that channel. Yeah, the tell you a little story. As a reporter, you know, I had to cover ground zero for that entire year. And I also, you know, had to cover funerals and I had to cover a, a particular firehouse I wandered upon where they lost half their men. So the men that were lost were heroes. The men that were alive were heroes. Their widows and their children and their own right are the heroes just for the difficult business of getting on with life. And it was really hard, brother, because it wasn't like a guy that wrote a book, you know, and it came out a year afterwards or 20 years afterwards. It wasn't like a gal that wrote a magazine article and then never went back. I was writing it in real time. And what I was doing was asking for intimate, 
feelings, thoughts. You know, you're watching a five-year-old boy try to grapple with death. And it's in real time because you're putting it in the pages of the New York Times every two weeks, every month, what have you. And there was a firefighter. His name was Sean Cummins. Sean was, he wouldn't say it, but he was the number one recovery guy. Very, he was like a, like a jockey of a man is built and he was trained for um, rescue in small crevices. So he was the guy who was crawling actually under the pile looking for people. I wrote about him a number of times and he, he was probably did two, 3,000 hours in there. I wrote about him a couple of times. He was fed up, he was broken down, he was uh, sick. And our last meeting was at a coffee shop in Manhattan. He goes, look here, mate, he's you know, from Ireland. I'm done with the hero thing. Not everybody that wears the badge is a hero. Not every hero has a badge. And that was the last, after six really intense months together, it's the last I ever heard of him. And he called me last night. And it was like yesterday. We spoke for four hours. He volunteered for Iraq as a paratrooper. His son is a special operations soldier. He, he, got, he got the ground zero sickness. It's in his throat. My friend, Eddie Keating, one of the greatest photographers of the, of, of the, of the turn of the century, he's got brain cancer. I'm pretty sure it's from there. So yeah, God bless the firefighters. And God bless us all, I suppose. Charlie the Duff, thank you. And I hope you get some time in the cabin for some solemn time alone. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you having me. When we return, we'll talk to a couple who lived in New York and how they helped the Native community heal from this tragedy. Diane Frayer and Steve Thornton made their way from Oklahoma to New York City over 30 years ago. Diane is the director of Amarinda, a multimedia arts organization based in Manhattan. Steve just retired from the Park Service where he worked at the Statue of Liberty. Welcome, Steve and Diane. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. I'd like to start with you, Steve. You were working for the Park Service. Maybe uh, help us relive those days. I was on the staff boat that morning and. Uh, we sleep down by, uh, down by the uh, ferry building. And somebody I was outside said there was like these little black pieces falling from the sky. We didn't know what it was. So I went outside. We all went outside and they said, uh, somebody said, uh, a plane crashed in the World Trade Center. But what we was, we couldn't see it. So we pulled out. We looked up to the, we could see that with the North Tower was burning. All of a sudden, we heard a plane flying real close to the water. We saw the plane crash into the South Tower. Kind of went like this, and we turned in. Kind of looked like a movie almost. That's how it looked. And everybody just gasped. We couldn't believe it happened. Like, we was all in shock. So then we went to the statue and picked all the employees up. And then we went to uh, Ellis Island and let people live in New Jersey off. And take all the people that live in Manhattan in New York back to Berry Park and let us off. They didn't tell us where to go or anything. We said it was all on our own. There's thousands of people running every direction, and it wasn't always like it's all chaos. And uh, so I walk, we started walking, I started walking towards uh, on, uh, a ball in Panama by the ferry building. I was over there and all of a sudden I heard this huge explosion. And then all this, like like a big bomb went off. And we looked down the street and all this big cloud of dust and started coming towards us. So then everybody, we all took off. We all went in different directions. And I walked towards, a lot of people were walking towards FDR. Thousands of people. We all had dust covering us, which is part of, and there's people in that dust also. Mm -hmm. So we started walking, I might said anything. He just walks, like, you know, just slowly walk. I got off at Chinatown, and I walked down the 
Expressway, and I was walking through Chinatown, and uh, somebody said, "There it goes." And I, I, I turned around, and I was, and I was on the street, and I looked up, and the North Tower. So the North Tower collapsed. And we turned, everybody turned around and stepped on walking. I walked to the walked to my apartment. And, well, my sister, she worked for the National Museum of the American Indian, and uh, she her her subway stop was right in, in the bottom of the World Trade Center. I said when she got off the train, the police said, "Go, go, run, run, go, get out of the building." And she ran. They all ran to the where she worked in the National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, Afterwards, her and some co her co-workers, because they lived in Brooklyn, she went late to stay with them because everything was shut down. The subways shut down, the buses, everything was shut down. There was no traffic. The city was just uh, quiet. Diane, maybe talk about what was going on with the American Indian groups in uh, New York City at the time. We were just with everyone else in a state of shock. Um, there was really no, cell phones weren't, not everybody had, if you think back, not everybody had a cell phone then. C communication was really shut down. No, no one knew anything uh, about anybody. You, if you had loved ones in that neighborhood, you were really, you, you were very tense and very worried. People forget also to the debris falling from the building as well as the actual collapse. That was going on for quite a while and that, that many people were lost because of that. Um, so you, we, my niece and I just, just waited. That's all we could do was wait. Then finally Steve did come through the door. Um, I mean, we were just like everybody. People were, um, in a state of shock and the overwhelming uh, grief of, of losing so many defenseless, innocent people is, uh, you, you really uh, can't absorb that all at once. And we knew that there were a lot of Central and South American Indian people working in that building and all the service industries and the restaurants and the cleaning staff and the maintenance staff. That There were a lot of in the service part of it. We knew that. And we knew that there were people from all, uh, all walks of life, all types. There was a complete cross-section of humanity in those buildings. Do you feel your utter powerlessness and you have to just wait and see that's all you can do at that point when you're in the middle of such an enormous tragedy what steps do you take to go on after what how do you heal yourself or uh, move forward as time moved forward during the year uh, a longtime community member who's also uh, a native person from oklahoma um, joe cross was, was caddo and Pot potawatomi Joe uh, came to me and said that he wanted to do something um, for the people because they were we were moving towards the one year anniversary, and of course that was a very going to be a very structured event uh, with the families at the center of it, but a great deal happening with politicians and we've, in those days people were because. There, the grief was so intense. So many people um, had been lost. So much suffering. People were looking for anything that would help them to understand why. Not so much how or how we prevent it again. Yes, but but why, and and what to do. How to how to go forward. Joe worked with myself and of course the people on the board of Amarinda, and uh, to organize. Uh, what we I would describe as a wiping away the tears ceremony to help. Um, and Jake Swamp, who has now passed, he's walked, he's gone on. But Jake was a medicine person, a Mohawk. Uh, we reached out to the people whose original land it had been, and they came down. Okay, they came down, and then Linda Pula came up from Oklahoma City. Or in Oklahoma, she was Delaware, Lenny Lenape, originally people from here. And we did a wiping away of the tears ceremony um, uh, to help on the one year anniversary so that those in spirit could walk on in peace and that um, 
to help the families and everyone else and to, to remove any negativity remaining down there. And we only have a few seconds left, but I do want to ask how you're faring during this anniversary. Uh, I don't like to think about 9-11 that much. Uh, it's like a, it's a terrible day. And, uh, in a way, I like when they, the media talks about days on days and they just reminds you of uh, all the people that died that day. So I try not to think about it too much. I pray for the people that passed away. And it was a mourning still after all these years. The same for myself. Yeah, it's too hard to, to, to relive, to keep going back and revisiting the, the, the hurt and the terrible event, the negativity, really, the loss of the people, the suffering, so much suffering that didn't have to happen. And, well, thank you. thank you so much for sharing your story today. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.